I know Mark just prayed, but I always pray before I speak as well. So would you join me? Father, um, we just continue in this spirit of humility and of openness. Uh, we have come to hear your spirit. We've already been blessed in our time of worship and fellowship together. Now in these moments, I pray your voice would be heard in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm continuing uh, from last week's message. I was loving Egypt last week, and we're going to go to the inverse and transverse and reverse of that today to talk about loving Babylon, loving Babylon. And I regret every time I speak, I always have more to say than I have time. I, I understand. I like provocative titles. And when I thought about the message for today, uh, I think it's a provocative title. In the Adventist world and culture and those who've grown up, Babylon does not exhibit the types of qualities that we would normally think about wanting to love. So I hope that you will be patient. I hope that you will give me an opportunity to explain what I mean when I say loving Babylon. And it, it, will, it will be something I think that, that it gives us time to pause and think about. But in reality, it is not going to be uh, anything more profound than, than what I shared last week. It's going to tie in right with it. Um, as believers, we, we understand that Jesus has called us to love all people, of course. But I think it's healthy and helpful when we're more precise in defining who it is that we're loving. It's very easy to say, yes, I love all people because what God has done, for, except the guy that just cut me off in the street, he's an idiot. Right? You know what I'm saying? Oh, and God has done so much good for me, and I, he said, oh, but he just slide tackled me in soccer and talk, knock, knocked me down, and now it's out. Where's Patrick? <laughs> now, I'm not saying that, that, that you struggle with that. It's easy to say in general, yes, we should love everyone. Jesus says to love our enemies. Yes, we, we get that. But when the more precise you are about what that means, I think it's healthy in our spiritual journey. Should we love those who disagree with us? Oh, sure. Should we love those who hate us? Yeah? Yeah. Should we love those who hurt us? Yes. Loving Babylon. So there's going to be a lot of connections between this message and last time. I think I broke it, guys. But um, tying the, the loving Egypt and loving Babylon, really they're two sides of the same coin. We're going to look at the other side of the coin. Kids quiz. Ah, uh, see you guys. I love it. Thank you, Jaden. Thank you, Toby. For our young people, always begin with a little interactive time in the service. Who was the, the first king of Babylon that we read about in the book of Daniel? He's got an awesome name. Kyle, I saw Kyle's hand. Is the orange mic uh, working? Turn it on. There you go. Let's give it one more try. Just double check. Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. An amazing case study is Nebuchadnezzar. Very wicked individual. Even by the standards of the day, Nebuchadnezzar followed in the alliance of the wicked Assyrian kings and the raising up of Babylon. Uh, and, uh, and yet, and yet, there was a plan for Nebuchadnezzar, wasn't there? According to the Bible, if we we're to understand Daniel chapter 4 correctly, if we're in heaven, guess who we're going to meet there? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Very interesting. Um, what mighty river flows through Babylon? We talked about the Nile. It went through Egypt. All ancient cities uh, that had any significance had to be built on a river or by water. What was the name of the river that Babylon was built on? Any of you geography people? Mom, dad, you can help out. Um, do you have someone over here? The Jordan River? It's not the Jordan, but that is a very important biblical river. It's not that. It's actually bigger than the Jordan. One of the great rivers of the world, actually. Abel. Euphrates. The Euphrates River. That is correct. The largest river in Western Asia, the longest river, one of the great rivers, part of the Mesopotamian, uh, uh, part of the Fertile Crescent, uh, the Euphrates River. A lot of history takes place on that river. 
Same, similar question from last week you, uh, when you were here, if you remember. Who are the first people, Bible characters mentioned in Babylon, which is also kind of the land of the Chaldeans. We'll, we could talk about that if we have time, but um, who are the first Bible characters? I'll give you a hint. It was the same Bible characters who were the first in Egypt. Same ones. Abel put his hand up. Is there... Oh, I see A.B. Well, I'm trying to have a variety here, you know. Do I have to say their first their first name or their changed name? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Miss Overachiever, whichever you would like. Uh, Abraham and Sarah. Okay, yeah. Partial credit for that. We'll give you that. <laughs> yeah, technically it's the ancestors of Abraham are mentioned first, his father and uncles. But really it's to introduce the family of faith. And this is very interesting. The ancestry of Abram and Sarah begins in Mesopotamia. It begins in the area of the Chaldeans of what would eventually become the great empire of Babylon. Their ethnic ties originate in Babylon. Just as ethnic ties would be developed with Egypt, the children of Israel, the followers of Abraham, are originally from the area of Mesopotamia, from the land of the Chaldeans, from Babylon. And uh, they will go back there in time as well as we remember. Number, or this next one, how did God speak to the king of Babylon? It's the same way that he spoke to Pharaoh, same way he speaks to a lot of people. Do I see a hand back here? By a dream. By dreams. I heard her. Very good. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar would have several dreams in which God is trying to communicate with him. This seems to be a favorite methodology. As Pharaoh had dreams. Others had dreams and visions as well. This is the last question. I want you to think about it. Did Jesus, the Son of God, ever visit Babylon? Specifically Jesus. All right, I see. I'm going to give Abel a shot and then we'll come to Isaac. Yes. Okay, Isaac, agree or disagree? No. Are you going to say no? <laughs> Was that really your answer or are you just trying to be opposite than Abel? Okay, so you're wrong. <laughs> no, I appreciate it, Isaac. The answer, and that's, that's the end, guys. Thank you, uh, Jaden and Toby. Yes, when did he do it? How many of you remember? What does that picture remind you of? Daniel chapter 3, right? Now, notice what it says in Daniel chapter 3. Remember the three Hebrews, they're thrown into the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar looks in and he says, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. And they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now, this has been widely debated about exactly what the terminology is and, and, it, and who it is. But it's quite clear that this is one of the extremely few specific manifestations of the pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament. Remember, the Old Testament, for the large part, God is the invisible God, right? He appears as an angel. He appears as fire. You know, he has these things. But nobody sees God in the Old Testament. He's even called the immortal, invisible God in the New Testament. The revelation, not just of the form of a God, but of the Son of God in Babylon, in the deliverance of his children for their faithfulness, yes, but also in the visibility of the wicked king of Babylon is extremely significant. Jesus never appeared in the temple in Israel. He didn't appear on, on Mount Carmel with Elijah. He does not appear on other powerful occasions when his power is manifested, but for some reason, the Son of God, before his incarnation and birth in Bethlehem, before he reveals himself to others, to this pagan wicked king, and by the way, Daniel does not say that anyone else saw him. Nebuchadnezzar appears to be the only person who could see him. Because when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out, it says the rest of the counselors, they're just looking at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, saying, hey, they're not burnt, they're not hurt, we don't even smell fire on them. They don't have this appearance of having seen the Son of God in the fire like Nebuchadnezzar did. Extremely unique for Jesus to specifically appear in Babylon. In Babylon is where Jesus first 
appears in this way that he would be identified. And I think Nebuchadnezzar was speaking by the Holy Spirit when he said, this is the Son of God. This is the Son of God. Again, just for your geographical reference, I I put a map like this up last time. All of the great events of ancient history flow through this fertile crescent area. The great empires uh, uh, spring up around these areas, and Israel has always been at the crossroads. And so they have an opportunity to impact the ancient world through that way. Now, it is a healthy Bible study to spend time comparing and contrasting the messages and the meanings between the two experiences of Egypt and Babylon. It really is. It's a worthy Bible study. These represent kind of the two bookends of the challenges of the children of Israel. Yes, they in their, in their peacetime and when they're successful of maintaining their territory through the periods of the kings and whatnot, great things get being learned there. But Egypt stands as this moment of great trial and deliverance out of the hands of the Egyptians. And then Babylon on the other end, speaks significantly to the challenges that the children of God would face throughout time. You have both this concept of slavery and captivity. You have forced labor versus forced worship. In both occasions, they are celebrated as deliverance through both fire and water. We remember the deliverance of fire, uh, of water, of course, with Egypt because of crossing the Red Sea. But the Bible is clear. God calls Egypt the burning furnace. Deuteronomy chapter 4, Genesis 15. Several times God says, I delivered you from the burning furnace of Egypt. Egypt was also a place where they were delivered from fire. And then in Babylon, of course, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, very uh, very dramatic, the deliverance from the furnace of fire. But then Revelation says that Babylon also will be destroyed by water. Babylon the Great will be cast into the sea just as the Egyptian army was consumed by the Red Sea. So there's all these comparisons and contrast and contrast. And it is, uh, uh, again, it's a fruitful study. In Egypt, Israel was enslaved because of Egypt's sins right? It wasn't because Israel had rebelled and God sent the Egyptians to capture them. It was simply the system of the world at that time that they were placed under slavery. The Bible does not make any indication that it was because Israel sinned. But when it comes to Babylon, it's different. It was specifically allowed because of Israel's sins. So you have these two ideas. Sometimes we suffer because of other people's hatred and sin. And sometimes we suffer because of our own hatred and sin. And there's just so many other, you can tie the spiritual things together, secularism versus false religion, worldliness, spiritualism, past deliverance versus future exodus. The, remember, the children of Israel were called to come out of Babylon. Remember that, right? That's what the word exodus means. It means the way out. Just as there was an exodus from Egypt, there would be an exodus also from Babylon. So there's just, again, books have been written on this, but again, in your own individual time, you'll see many important things. Ignorance versus arrogance, the, the role of the law on both the part of the Egyptians, the Israelites, and the Babylonians. I don't have time to get into all of it, but you should. I think it's a, a good experience of Bible study because they paint a, 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 a massive um, message regarding God's plan for our lives. Jeremiah 51 is a, a, a passage where Jeremiah goes into great detail about the rise and fall of Babylon. And he says this, in Jeremiah 51, verses 8 and 9, specifically of Babylon. He says, and by the way, this hasn't happened yet. This is a prophecy he's speaking of. Suddenly, Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wail over her. Bring balm for her pain. Interesting. She's in pain, and we need to bring balm to her. Perhaps she may be healed, but alas, and I'm ad-libbing a little bit, (laughs) alas, We applied healing to Babylon, but she was not healed. Different and uh, uh, distinct from the biblical narrative as it comes to Egypt, something is different about Babylon. Babylon is not redeemed. Babylon is irredeemable. Isaiah 13, Babylon, this is hundreds of years, by the way, before the events take place. Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Never be inhabited, lived in from generation to generation. Her fateful time will come. Her days will not be prolonged. God makes it clear. This is a bad situation. 
This isn't like uh, other nations that go astray and yet the, the redemption of God prevails and they're able to be brought back into the fold. Babylon stands for and illustrates a system that is beyond saving. It's irredeemable and absolute like Sodom and Gomorrah. The time came where their patience and tolerance of God could no longer withstand the arrogance and the violence, and they had to be destroyed. So also is Babylon. Babylon is compared to the fall of Lucifer. All right? As, the, as Lucifer fell and is irredeemable, so also is Babylon, both literally and spiritually. Oops. Fallen, fallen. The double fallen nature of, of the statement here of the second angel in Revelation 14. Babylon is fallen, and then you get that duplication. Fallen. It's, it's a way of emphasizing it is beyond restoring. Fallen, fallen. And then, of course, the call that I mentioned earlier, it's time to get out. There's nothing less left that can be done. Utterly irredeemable is what Babylon is and what it stands for in the last days, which begs the question, what then there is to love? What is there to love about Babylon, given the clear biblical narrative that it is beyond saving. What is it that we are to love? Briefly and, and, and quickly, Babylon is that glorious kingdom, the head of gold that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream of the metal man. All right, and Daniel says, you are the head of gold. It was the glory. It, it, it still stands even in secular textbooks as a, a minute example of the potential power of a point in time when a kingdom can become absolutely at its uh, paramount best. Babylon represents that. It has a short history. It is significant in the Bible. As I mentioned last week, Egypt's mentioned way more, over 600 times. But Babylon is a close second. It's mentioned 300 times specifically as Babylon. But if you include other terms, the land of the Chaldeans, the land of Ur, things like that, it's over 400 times. Extremely significant in the Bible and worthy of our analysis and our study and attention. Again, just like Egypt, there is a unique relationship between Babylon and the Jews, different than other nations. But as we have pointed out, doomed, doomed. So what is there to love? Isn't it interesting, despite the reality of the ultimate failing and falling and destruction, God still put his people in Babylon. He still put them there. Not because they were to redeem the system, but because there were people in the system that God wanted to redeem. It was because there were still individuals open to the possibility of salvation. I like what the commentary said about this in referencing the captivity. This is the SDA commentary. By the captivity... God purposed not only to bring Israel to repentance, clearly the Babylonian captivity was partly judgment and punishment for the wickedness of Israel. But God had lots of ways of exercising his judgment. He could have done it a number of ways, and he does over time through various prophets, various challenges, various you know circumstances where he's trying to get their attention. But the time came when he had to raise up this power, which again was their original ethnic beginnings. He raises up the Chaldeans from where Abram and Sarai had originated to go and get his wayward children and bring them back. All right? So this idea and this plan had been understood by God for a long time, but it wasn't just to punish and bring his own people to repentance, but notice, but to acquaint with the true religion the Babylonians and the other nations whom the Jews would meet. The Babylonians were given the opportunity to know and follow Jehovah. This is very similar to like when Paul would get arrested in the New Testament. He'd be placed in jail because he'd been preaching too much and the people didn't like it. So what did Paul do? He said, great, I'll preach to the prisoners. I'll preach to the jail keepers. I'll get them to accept Jesus Christ. This is the circumstance that God has put me in. Doesn't bother me. I'm going to still do the ministry that God is calling me. 
called me to. So similarly, when God takes his people into Babylon, yes, the system is destined for for absolute failure, but there are still people in the system that God wants to win. Do you understand? Notice a couple of passages. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel and a few other characters really stand as the primary examples of the children of Israel in Babylon. You got Nehemiah and Ezra and uh, uh, Esther, uh, Zerubbabel, Joshua, but you know Daniel and a few others really stand as the paramount people. This is the very end of Daniel's book. Uh, the angel says to him, "Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time." Daniel's in Babylon when he when he has this vision. That's where he is. And he's told the wisdom and the prophecies and the visions that you have are not going to be understood by all. They're going to be sealed up in a mystery for a long time. And then it says this, many will be purged, purified, and refined. Who's the many? Who is going to be purged and purified and refined? The wicked are going to act wickedly. None of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. The message of Daniel, originally given in the kingdom of Babylon, would stay in Babylon, and hundreds of years later, wise men from the east will come seeking the king of Israel. Now, we don't know who they are necessarily. Again, lots of debate, but we know they come from the regions and environs from which Daniel had been. The message and the wisdom and the knowledge of God was deposited in Babylon, and from that region, people would come to understand the truth about Jesus Christ. Many other examples could be pointed out. The story of Esther Now, she takes place in the period of the Persian kingdom, but it's still in the regions and environment of Babylon. And again, the the statue of Daniel 2, even though it starts with Babylon, it goes through all the other nations, and all of them are struck by the stone at the end and destroyed forever. So even though we're in the period of Persia with uh, Esther, it is still in the same structure of fallen worship that the idol represented in Daniel chapter 2. But you all know the story of Esther, and this is probably one of the most repeated and, and, and... and, and, and loved passages from the book of Esther. She's struggling to know what to do about this threat that's been made against the Jews. And her cousin Mordecai says to her, if you remain silent, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance arises from the Jews from another place. God will still find a way of saving the Jews and you and your house may perish. But who knows whether or not you have attained royalty for such a time as this. Esther, you have been placed here in this area of Mesopotamia, in in the regions of Babylon during the time of the Persians, because God has a plan for you to bring salvation, not only to your people, but the opportunity to spread the message of God to this community. The system is still going to perish, but there are people in that system. Ezekiel, an amazingly mysterious book, more than 60 times in the book of Ezekiel, this statement appears, that they may know that I am the Lord. That's like the heartbeat, the drumbeat of Ezekiel, that they may know I am the Lord, that they may know that I am the Lord. Sometimes he's talking about the Jews. Sometimes he's talking about Gentiles. Here in Ezekiel 36, he's talking about Gentiles. I will vindicate the holy... By the way, I bring up Ezekiel just in case you don't know. He was also in Babylon. Ezekiel was the prophet that lived. He was in the silver mines with the Jews in Babylon or during the period of, of Babylon. All right, And God raises up a prophet in Babylon. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Speaking to Israel. It's, you have not held up my name the way I want, but then the, but God says, I'm going to vindicate my holiness. Then the nations, then the nations will know that I am the Lord. The people of the nations will have opportunity to know, declares the Lord, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. I could go on and on and on. Time and time again, God shows that he has love and desire to bring salvation even to those who are in a system that is diametrically opposed and destined to absolute destruction. What does it mean to love Babylon? I went back to this verse. It's still from the Loving Egypt series last week. If God wanted Israel to love the stranger that was in their midst while living in Israel, doesn't it also 
you know, uh, equate that God would want us to love the stranger when we're living in their community? Are we only to love the stranger when they come into the church? Oh, you came into church today. What a, what a beautiful day. Lo- Happy Sabbath. Love you. But when you see him elsewhere, oh man, you're a Democrat? Whoa. Come find Jesus when you come to church next week. Oh, welcome to church and Lord bless you. And then, oh, you ready to get uncomfortable? You're a homosexual? Well, you're destined to destruction. Oh, I can be funny when I want to be funny. And I can be serious when I want to be serious. What's the difference? Are we to love the stranger only when they're in church? Or are we to love all people even when we're in their comfort zone? Babylon is irredeemable. The system is going to fall, guys. False worship, counterfeit faith, empty religion, arrogant philosophies. Only the stone that God said would come and destroy the statue. Only the coming of Christ will eliminate this damaging, demonic system that is in the world. But we are not at war with that system. It's not our job to win that system. It's our job to look for people and to love people who are in that system. As God loved Nebuchadnezzar, and he revealed in power and in a unique time a moment and ulti- in, in, in Daniel 3 with the, the furnace, and ultimately Nebuchadnezzar would become a believer in Jesus. And many others, some we don't even know. Did you know, I wasn't sure, did you know for the last 20 years, and this is what made me think of it, this, this spontaneous appearance of Christ in Babylon, very unique, spontaneous appearance of Christ in the fiery furnace, saving Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Did you know that for the last 20 years or so, there have been spontaneous appearances of Jesus Christ to Muslims who are on their hajj or their pilgrimage to Mecca. Hundreds of Muslims have come out. You can go on YouTube. You can watch it. It's documented who are saying, as I was traveling to Mecca, Jesus came and appeared to me. It is a phenomenon that is happening uh, repeatedly. Documented Muslims are accepting Christ in large numbers, that doesn't mean that they're Seventh-day Adventists today, okay? That doesn't mean that they've been baptized, but they are seeing Jesus today in spontaneous moments as God continues His desire to save all people. Now, any of you, am I the only one that's heard of this? Yeah, yeah. You know you can believe everything on the internet. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. These are documented, well-established realities and uh, there are some people that have actually started putting these studies together and showing it. And, and it's an amazing thing. We could spend a lot of time on it. Loving Babylon means seeking the salvation of, of people. Okay? When I say loving Babylon, I'm saying loving those in the system. I'm going to get more specific in a second. Separating the system from individuals. Maintaining hope for the sinner. These are all just kind of simple platitudes of saying the same thing. Loving people. People that disagree with you. People that hate you. Even people that hurt you. We are called to love. To put it in more specific terms. You know, I remember when John Paul II died. I was early in my ministry. And please don't look it up, people. Don't look it up. But there were members of my church kind of running around like the munchkins did when the wicked witch died. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Clap your hands, get out of bed. I'm not that old. Come on, you guys know that, right? The Wizard of Oz? There was a a, a moment of celebration among many of my members. And I remember thinking, I don't understand. I don't agree with everything that John Paul II did, but should we celebrate his death? I I don't think that was the, the right idea. You know you can love both at the same time, right? 
You know you can love Palestinians and love Jews at the same time? You don't have to choose. You don't have to choose. You can hate that they're suffering on both sides. And you can love them and you can hope for their salvation without screaming obscenities or without wishing for evil or destruction upon the other one. This is the way of the world. We can love Muslims and we can love Jews. Yes, a few weeks from the election, friends. I'm going all Marianne Williamson on you here. <laughs> I don't care what your politics are. I don't care who you vote for. Hatred is wrong. It's wrong. No matter what someone does politically, this world is passing away, friends. Vote your conscience. Do what you feel is right. But we've got to learn to love each other despite our political differences. That's what loving Babylon means. It means loving people despite the system that they're caught up in. Have you ever met any of these folks? Not in this church, but in other churches. You may have met Adventists that don't always hold the ideals. Don't give up. Love them. Those that are backslidden, those that are in extreme positions, those that are not always living up to the ideals. I could put a hundred categories up here. You know what the categories are for you. What are the categories for you? We are called to be different. The world says that division and arrogance and shouting is the way to go. It's the way you win. It doesn't work for us. It's not the way. As we head deeper and deeper into these chaotic and crazy times, the one thing that will separate the true church from Babylon will be we will love while they hate. We will love while they hate. Loving Babylon means loving people. And just like last week, it means loving Phoenix. That's where we are, unless you're from New York or Connecticut, or if you're watching from Kenya, you can also love your community where you're from. This is the community God has placed us in. And whether it is the challenges of secularism or the challenges of false worship, it doesn't matter. God has given us a mission, and that mission is to seek the salvation, and manifest the presence of Jesus every chance we get in our community. Do you love Phoenix? Do you love the Jewish center that's just a block down here? You know, when you drive to church, do you see the Orthodox Jews walking up and down there? When you see them, do you say, Lord, bless them today? Do you wave? Do you say, Happy Shabbat? Do you care? Wherever you are, your work, your neighborhood, are you trying to be an example of Jesus Christ? When the neighbor puts up the, the sign that is for the candidate you don't like, do you rip it down? Do you put a bigger sign up that blocks theirs? Yeah, go for this guy. Or do you try to be kind and say, you know what? God's in control, whatever happens. Do you love Phoenix? Do you love your neighbor? I pray that God would grow that love. None of us have arrived. I pray that God would grow that love in every single one of us. It's hard. It doesn't come natural. It can only come through our submission to the Holy Spirit and asking God to help us.
You know, in a couple weeks' time, our country may look very different than it looks now. Are you ready to be more focused on love? I hope so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know that this is somewhat simplistic. I know that this is idealistic in some ways. In the real world, there is pain. There's fear. There's frustration. There has been loss. There's been sacrifice. Father, we know that this world is passing away and is not destined to last forever. But we have been placed here for this time as Esther was, as Daniel was, as Ezekiel was, to still stand for you. And you never know who will look into the fire and see Jesus. Help us, Father. Help us to be the people you want us to be and to care about our neighbors, to care about our community, and stand for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.